The Tom Woods Show, episode 1756. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. We're talking about masks today. I hadn't really taken this on up to now, but it's just everywhere in conversation and in the news. Masks just can't be avoided, ultimately. And I wanted to try to find what has been written on it. And it's actually surprisingly little in terms of actual real-life scientific studies, not conjecture, not assuming what's to be proven and then building a model around that, not assuming the effectiveness of masks and then running some math and saying if we wore them, it would do X and Y. That's really not that valuable. I want to really, really get to the bottom of it. And there's not a whole lot out there. And then I was talking to Greg Morin, whom I've known for a long time, and it turns out he had actually gone through and just scoured the literature on this and written a pretty meaty post about it. And then when I got a look at that, I thought, let's talk about this on the show. I'm not speaking as dogmatically about this as I would about Thomas Jefferson or something I know inside and out, but I'm curious, like I think most of you, And Greg's a very reasonable, very smart guy, and I thought we'd have an interesting conversation. Greg is a longtime listener of The Tom Woods Show, been active in the liberty movement for many years, holds a bachelor's and master's degree in chemistry from Emory University and a PhD in organic chemistry from the University of Notre Dame. By day, he runs a small manufacturing business, and by night, he pens various editorial articles for local media outlets that are republished on his blog site, gregmorin.com. That's M O R. I N and drawing on his science background, he recently felt compelled to address some of what he perceives as the deficiencies in the reporting on mask efficacy. Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. Great to be here. All right. I have kind of sidestepped this question up to now because I thought I, in a way to me, it's been like the Kennedy assassination. It's not that it's not an interesting topic. It's not that it's not important. It's that it seems like what I would have to master in order to have an opinion on it is vast. Right. And I just feel like I've got only so much time on this earth. And to me, the key thing about the mask issue is that I could see it being really, really contentious if, let's say, it was debatable looking at the charts and seeing, well, in this jurisdiction, they have this mask mandate and the cases do start to go down after that. And then we have to argue about whether that was a coincidence, were they already going to... But that's not really the case. You see mask mandates going into effect at all stages of the virus's spread in a particular place, right. and the, on the uptick, on the downside. So I just feel like the, that itself strongly suggests, doesn't prove it, but it strongly suggests that masks are not all that important. But I, I still want to go a little bit deeper into the question. So you have an article on your blog, and I'm going to link to that article for people to check out at tomwoods.com slash 1756. But the gist of your article is that masks ain't what they're cracked up to be. Now, obviously, we're going to go into point by point about that. But let's start with the overall, I mean, you grant that your degrees are in chemistry and therefore you're not allowed, none of us are allowed to say anything about anything. But I I think at some level, as long as you have a certain amount of intelligence, you can actually comment on some things. So how do do you want to set this up? Uh, Well, my mindset was, you know, being a chemist, I do have the science background. And as that kind of seems to be the environment that we're in today, you're not allowed to speak on anything unless you have expertise in that particular area. And while I don't think there's any particular group or science that studies masks per se and nothing else, I have enough knowledge of the scientific method and what constitutes a good study and a poor study and the ability to differentiate whether or not there are proper controls and that sort of thing. And so I kept hearing constantly, you know, we all hear the mask work, the science tells us this. And that was just a bit too triggering for me. And there was only so much that I could take. So I basically decided, okay, let's dig into these articles. They say the mask work, let's click down to the links. And in a lot of cases, you have to click through several layers to get there because one outlet will reference another outlet who will reference another outlet and so on and so on and so on. And you dig down and then you finally get to the actual article. And what I found when I did that was that pretty much every single one of the cases, there was a different 
sort of article. And most of them had to do with some type of contrafactual model. Those were the ones most commonly cited. Um, there were also the uh, anecdotal studies, the um, uh, the Great Clip study that's referenced a lot as being you know definitive proof. Well, they did this study in this uh, haircut uh, establishment, and nobody got sick, but no wore masks, and there we go, case closed. They'll use the word study, and that's not what it is. It's a study, sort of in the layman's term, but it's not a scientific study, and it doesn't really establish anything because there are so many variables involved. And so, well, in fact, Dr. Fauci had it raised to him the prospect of actually doing a real live study like an actual scientific study. Right. And he says the problem would be that that would involve, for the sake of testing and running the study, you'd have to have some people not wearing masks and other people wearing masks and then having them interact and see what happens. And he says, I'm not about to tell people not to wear masks. So the very fact that he responded that way kind of suggests that there isn't definitive scholarly work on the subject of masks or he would have just referred people to that. So he was explaining why it would be difficult actually to run such a study in the first place. Now, we are going to go into the arguments in your paper, but I want to just start off with what seems to be a plausible case for masks, at least to a lay ear like mine. And the reason I hadn't really touched masks was my thought was, all right, if we have reason to believe that the virus, and and maybe it could be, we could be talking about other viruses too, because the principle of masks would be the same. But if the virus spreads through droplets that tend to come out of my mouth when I'm, let's say, coughing or sneezing or whatever, even shouting loudly. Yeah, even speaking, then, like just breathing, that's the claim. Yeah, and, or even just breathing. Yeah. yeah, it could be, but but obviously worse if I'm really projecting it outward. Right, with right. It. I mean, you haven't heard me. I can cough <laughs> with the best of them. And it would seem to me that regardless of getting down to the issue of how wide are the things and could they fit through the holes in the mask or whatever, it just seems like, but obviously a lot of what I'm, what's coming out of me when I cough is being held back by the mask. So sh- wouldn't we think that that would do some good? Like, isn't there a, a plausibility to it just on the face of it? Yes, yes, no, it's, well, it is, it's superficially plausible just thinking about it in that way. And it's also, they are efficacious in certain frameworks. And that's part of the problem with the analysis is that it is this completely binary. It's masks work under all conditions and all types, regardless whether it's N95 or surgical or cloth. They're all exactly the same and they all work, case closed. And obviously, there's more nuance to it. And so I try to tease people a little bit. I, I kind of will use the same rhetoric. Of, well, masks don't work. And no, I don't mean that literally because it is more nuanced than that. And so historically, masks obviously have been used environments, uh, surgeons wear them when they're performing surgery. And most of the studies pre-COVID, if you go into them, the analysis is how efficacious are they in being applied to people that are actively sick? They're in the hospital, they're coughing, whatever. They, they're, you know, they have a very significant number of symptoms and they are used in that environment. And in that environment, they are effective. They minimize the output of these particles so there, there is a place for them, and that place is for those that are actively sick and that are also at risk. But that's not what's being called for in the literature, So they, or not in the literature, in the media right now. Um, they kind of take this claim over here that is valid and then extend it to everything else and just kind of ignore the rest and say, well, I'm sure it's fine. Well, you start your article with a passage that maybe people who follow this very closely may have seen. From this very year in the New England Journal of Medicine, I'm going to read it. Quote, we know that wearing a mask outside healthcare facilities offers little, if any, protection from infection. Public health authorities define a significant exposure to COVID-19 as face-to-face contact within six feet with a patient with symptomatic COVID-19 that is sustained for at least a few minutes, and some say more than 10 minutes or even 30 minutes. The chance of catching COVID-19 from a passing interaction in a public space is therefore minimal. In many cases, the desire for widespread masking is a reflexive reaction to anxiety over the pandemic, which seems, first of all, that's a very, very, by New England Journal of Medicine standards, that's why. A very provocative statement by that type of rhetoric. And it reads to me as if they're saying, This is a way of making people feel like they're either protecting themselves or others, that they're doing something, even though they're not really doing anything. And in the atmosphere, in the situations in which they're being asked to wear masks, it is exceedingly unlikely they're going to catch anything anyway. Right. Yeah. And that's why I put that right at the forefront, because 
the conditions under which we're being told that we have to wear them simply do not imply that, that there's a high degree of likelihood that there's going to be transmission. We're being asked to wear them in the grocery store as we're walking down the sidewalk. You're not having these extended interactions that would result in any type of infection. And th there's other studies I can get into them or, or not, I, but I can send you the links and you can you can put them on the show note page as well. But basically what they also reiterate that that finding is that in one of these studies, they actually looked at masks and the level at which they reduced particle emission through the mask. So in this particular case, it was surgical masks. And then they looked at the actual viral load in those particles. And in most cases, people who are actively sick, 70% of them didn't even have anything in the particles, that it was undetectable. And out of the, the amount that was detected, although the masks reduced it, the number of particles, it was so low that they basically said, we had these people breathing into these machines for 30 minutes, and even the output where they weren't wearing the mask was basically at the lower level or at the, the detection limit of the machine. And so they stated that, you know, we feel that it's very likely from this result that extended exposure would be required in order to uh, get an infection from this. So it seems that although they, there are the mechanistic studies that kind of confirm the sort of obvious intuitive idea that, well, there's viral particles, and if those particles are caught by the mask, it's going to stop them. But if it's well below the limit of infection, then it's not really accomplishing anything other than the psychological aspect of people feel like they're doing something, which that brings me to another point I'd like to bring up, but I, I don't want to, you know, if you have another question, but I'll, I'll kind of break there. No, 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 feel free to keep going, and then okay. I'll, I'll jump in after you're done about okay. what, with this. Yeah, so the point is that if we are being told everyone needs to wear them, what it does is it, to pun intended, masks everyone. So you have the sick and the healthy and the vulnerable and not vulnerable all look the same and are basically otherwise identical. Everyone's wearing the masks. So first of all, it creates a moral hazard because then people think, oh, the mask protects me so I can you know, touch it and I can pull it down and I can you know, take it off. I don't worry about it. It's this magical mask that even the CDC director claimed that the masks are better than a vaccine. And that is very, very irresponsible. But my point is, by making everyone appear to be identical, we're actually not focusing on those that actually need the protection. So if the healthy aren't wearing the masks and you only have people that are sick or that are at risk, they're wearing the mask, that sends a signal to everyone. That person is sick or vulnerable. I'm going to stay away from them. I'm going to social distance to a greater degree than six feet. So it's going to provide a much greater level of protection because everyone in the environment is cognizant of what is going on. We all want to do the right thing. So we're going to stay away from them and give them a wide berth. And it's going to protect them. It's going to protect us. But when you remove that signal, then everyone just assumes, well, I have this mask and they said that it, it cures everything and it fixes everything. So I don't really need to worry about this. So I think that can may indirectly actually be making things worse possibly because people that should be more distanced, that physical distance is not being maintained because people feel that they have this shield of having the mask and, and we can get lax the days ago with the social distancing or physical distancing. Folks, let me take just a brief minute to tell you about the way I solve a major problem that we all have. Because we're all intellectuals, we have a pile of books we want to read, we have no idea how we're going to get through all of them. And the answer is Blinkist. It's unique and powerful, works on your phone, your tablet, your web browser. It gives you the best key takeaways, the need-to-know information from over 3,000 nonfiction bestsellers in over 27 categories. Blinkist condenses them down into blinks, which you can read or listen to in just 15 minutes. And I like Blinkist because after that 15-minute blink, I know whether or not the full-length audiobook is really a good use of my time. I use Blinkist when I'm driving around in the car, which would otherwise be dead time, and I'm absorbing book after book while I drive. I've listened to these Blinks, and I highly recommend you check them out. Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker and The Doomsday Machine by Daniel Ellsberg. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership and up to 65% off audiobooks, yours to keep forever. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off a premium membership and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. Now, those are all reasonable points to make, I think. 
I want to throw in there something about the Dutch because there's a couple things to be said here. There's there's a major study that uh, the Dutch were doing on masks and their effectiveness mm -hmm. that was supposed to be ready at like the beginning of September. And then we haven't heard a word about it, not a word. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why that is. I have a suspicion as yeah. to why that is, but we haven't heard a word. But meanwhile, also related to the Dutch, I'm looking right now on my screen at an article from August 1st, 2020 from the Daily Mail in the UK. So this is not like Joe Blow's underground newsletter. Right. Like this is a major newspaper. And the headline is The Land with No Face Masks. Holland's top scientists say there's no solid evidence coverings work and warn they could even damage the fight against COVID-19. And when you, you look at it, they're saying things like um, the spokesman for their National Institute for Public Health said – Face masks in public places are not necessary based on all the current evidence. There is no benefit and there may even be negative impact. Now, I'll grant that that's not the mainstream opinion, but still that's a fairly significant authority making that claim. And the mainstream opinion, when you ask them, what is this based on other than just this intuitive sense that maybe I'm keeping some droplets from going through a barrier or something, right. they can't really point us to things. So they, again, what, when they do point us to things, they have all the faults that you're indicating. But I thought this was interesting that, that they looked and, – and I'll say one other thing. Somebody I, I like very much in this whole controversy is this fellow from Stanford, Jay Bhattacharya. And he has expertise in public health, economics, and also just a great deal of medicinal sort of questions. And he was asked about masks. And he said, look, I'm willing to be persuaded. But from what I have seen, the evidence seems fairly minimal on this. And now he said so he's not crazy. He's not publishing Joe Blow's underground newsletter. He's a reasonably intelligent person. But he's one of the few – on any subject who's willing to say something that's different from what the perceived mainstream says. So I was very interested in his opinion on masks. I know he hasn't said anything about it. And then when it was actually raised with him, he said, yeah, he said, now there are circumstances in which I would wear one. If I'm with my elderly, infirm parents, right, right. I would wear a mask, yeah. he says. But he just doesn't have a religious fervor about masks as being the be all end all. Because what we, you know, we've heard people say, if only Americans would just wear masks for six weeks religiously, we'd get out of this thing. That's clearly not true based on – just all you have to do is look at – I mean, Hawaii wore them for more than that, and they still had a whole bunch of cases. So – and you can find case after case of, of places where they warm for a long time. So I think this is like – it's almost like it's beyond evidence. It's just uh, – it's something that people want to believe. Yeah, it's really – then that's kind of the – what I've really noted is it seems to be almost like a religion because it's a lot of it's, it's not based on, I mean, there's a mi minimal plausibility to it, but then science is sort of referenced in a religious kind of way, wherever you hear someone say, well, trust the science, believe the science. You could say, well, trust the Bible, believe the Bible. Th those two phrases will be interchangeable. And that's kind of the mode that it seems to be coming from that basically the idea is that we just have to trust in science and we don't need to look any further. Well, let me jump in on correlation and causation here because you know, I've been saying an awful lot that you look at charts, you don't see any effect of mask mandates. Now, at the same time, I realize that it's like with economics. There are a million things going on at any one time. So if you raise the minimum wage to $20 an hour and unemployment falls, you don't thereby say, well, we just proved something about the minimum wage. Obviously, there are a million other things at play. But it seems that given the emphasis on masks, I mean, we even had the CDC director saying they're more effective and important than a vaccine, then I, I would expect the effect of masks at the very least to be, oh, I don't know, if not overcoming all other factors at work, at least to be somewhat evident on the graph. You know, I, I don't need the graph to be absolutely cartoonish where the next day after mask wearing, boom, it drops to zero. Right. I, it doesn't have to be like that. But there seems like given the emphasis on it and how effective they claim they are, I should nevertheless be able to see at least a little something. That's my point. Right, right. That would be the expectation that if, even if the effect is minimal, that at some point some country or city or state or region would have imposed some mask mandate with a high level of compliance and you would start to see some effect. The problem is a lot of times they, they do point it out, but it's it's very dishonest because 
these outbreaks, they have a standard sort of curve up and then broadly down. And just as an example, often they're very cherry picked. One that was out a few months ago, your old stomping ground in Kansas, they, uh, there was a chart going around how some counties had instituted a mask mandate and others had not. And it was shown that, well, we see the steady decline in the counties um, with mask mandate. Yeah, and it turned out it was dishonest. Yes, yes. They, they picked a particular date and someone dug into it and like, why did they pick that date? That seems odd. And so they got the whole chart and the mask mandate went into effect two weeks prior. And in that time frame, both the counties with and without masks both went up at approximately the same rate. And then we're flatlined for about two to three weeks. And then the one with the mask slightly dropped. But at this scale level, it, you were looking at basically about two or three cases per million difference, which is not really statistically significant in, in terms of that. But that's what all the pro-mask people would point at the seat. That proves it. And that's all we need to look at. So they're, they're not, you know, it, and it more has to do with, it's kind of weird how it's become a political thing that, you know, it seems to be more of those on the left are kind of pro-mask. We got to wear the mask. But it seems to be more among the proponents of that and in the media where that you see that narrative. And if you actually dig into these articles, the, the actual papers, but by and large, they're fair. They're actually not that bad. I mean, because that's the proper role of science. They say, okay, this is what we did. We looked at this. Here are some things we didn't look at. Here are some effects that may be a problem and they should be looked at in the future. And so it's not strictly, yep, we did it. Case closed. It completely proves it. Science is very rarely like that. It takes a very long time to, to prove that. And actually there was just, I just want to point out real quick. There was an article that just came out in nature a couple of weeks ago, right after, right after my article came out, but it was actually, it's actually a very excellent article, but they only looked at, they looked at different masks and they look at the, the mechanistic reduction in, in particles. But one thing that they noted, which I hadn't even thought of, which was a very you know, salient point, is that the particles go somewhere. Okay, they come out of your mouth, spittle, whatever, aerosols, it lands on the mask, fine. But once it's there, you're breathing through it and you may be aerosolizing whatever is on that mask and that, in effect, spreading it far and wide as though you had a, a can of spray and shh, you're just spraying it. That's much worse than if you had a larger particle that just kind of went out and fell on the ground somewhere. Furthermore, even if that is not, does not occur right away, they also point out, well, it can dry. And once it's dried, then it can also be carried across from the smaller particles, particularly on the fabric mask, cotton, um, those types of masks, because in their study, it was actually confounding their analysis because they were getting particles of the material itself being released as people breathe through it. So they couldn't really differentiate, okay, you're breathing through it. How many particles do we see being limited? They were actually seeing more particles coming out of the cloth masks than they did for the surgical N95. So it may very well be that in some cases, the masks are actually making it worse. And one other aspect that they pointed out, with, which I thought was rather large, but kudos to them for pointing it out, which they should, is they just looked at it under an idealized scenario. So a lot of these studies, they're idealized. Okay, everything is very controlled, which it should be. But in the real world, people aren't breathing through a small hole into a box that's measuring what's coming out of it. The mask is on their face and there is breath and air coming out the sides and up the top and all over. How much of it's coming out of there? It may very well be that... Once you look at that, a large portion of it is being directed outside. And in fact, the mask is literally doing nothing at all. So those, those are kind of the questions. And that, that was kind of the point of the article. You know, I'm not saying absolutely that they don't do anything at all. They obviously have a place and a time and an application. But it's really important that we ask these questions and figure out what is really going on here, because we may be doing exact opposite, worst thing that we should be doing because we're, we're basically right now we're engaged in a societal wide experiment. We've never done this before. Where we say, you know what? Everyone should just wear a mask all the time. <laughs> that that's a really big change. That's a really big experiment. And the, the largest consequence is the unknown unknown. We kind of assume, well, we know everything and we, we think, you know, there's only these minor effects and they should be fine. Well, there may be effects that we're not thinking of and we won't find these out for several years and they may be, much greater than the harm is caused by the virus itself. On the other hand, you get this kind of argument. Okay, maybe it's true that we don't have the definitive proof that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, what really is the imposition that we're asking for, really? Putting a mask on, if there's a chance that 
maybe having the mask makes you more, I don't know, aware of the situation, or maybe it does keep a few droplets in or whatever, then it's no big deal to you, but it could be a big deal to somebody on the other side of that mask. So we're not asking a whole lot. And maybe we will get definitive information about masks in the future. But for now, are we really asking so much? I think that's the common argument. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, co common claim. Yeah, that's that's the rejoinder you always get. And, you know, you can point out a few things. Again, none of them are going to be definitive either. You know, there, there are anecdotal cases of, you know, some people get skin infections or... or one most goes commonly goes around is well they limit oxygen well no they don't so I'm I'm here to debunk that I know you're probably going to get a bunch of hate mail on that because I got pushed back when my article went out but it doesn't limit your oxygen to any significant degree at all oxygen is present at 210,000 parts per million in the air CO2 is at 400 parts per million yes when you exhale there's going to be more CO2 trapped behind that mask so the, to the to the degree the mask is more effective you're going to increase the level of CO2 that you're rebreathing. And while you can sustain that, it's not ideal. And you, your body has to adapt and you have to breathe more. And some people report brain fog, particularly in those cases where people are wearing them all day. So if you're at work or you're at school, that's where it's really going to have an impact. If you're just going to the grocery store, okay, it's not really going to do anything other than fog up your glasses if you are one who wears glasses like I do, which I find extremely irritating when I have to wear my glasses and I have to put the mask on. You literally can't yeah. see anything. I can't see. Yeah. It's like, I, what? <laughs> it, that, that one really drives me crazy. But so I mean, like there weren't already enough disadvantages of being a nerd. Yeah. Now we have this one. Right. And I'm sure people, oh, and, uh, you know, you, you'd rather have someone die than your, fog, your glasses fog up. No, yeah, that's, that's not the point. The point is that these ancillary costs do add up, particularly when you look at, okay, fine, if you're going to say they work, then why don't we look at the, the meta-level analyses of countries and cities and states, and do we even see anything? And we, we, we do not. Now, that's not proof that that's not the case, because there are going to be confounding factors that may be influencing whether you're going to see the level go up or down, and that would be the argument in the other direction as well, to say, well, they're making it worse. Well, I mean, you may find that, well, in these, in these cities and states where they increase masks and the cases went up. Again, there could be other reasons for that. So both sides will tend to try to use the, uh, that sort of empirical evidence, and it's really not scientific to use it that way. It, you know, it can support the case to, to a degree. It, I think it tends to support the case that the masks aren't really doing anything because we really haven't seen any clear, definitive case where you, know, you saw a rapid decline following the, the mask use. And, and I think a lot of it, even if in theory it should work exactly as they're saying, stops the particles, the virus load in the particles, stops in the mask. Ideally, you should be changing that mask constantly throughout the day. So based on that article that they mentioned that, you know, you could be aerosolizing it once it's on there. Okay, well, then you want to be changing it all the time. But people aren't doing that. In the real world, you can make a recommendation, but then you have to look at it in terms of what are people going to do on the ground? And that's just, yeah. that's just not going to happen. It's like saying, well, we can get rid of all the police if people would just stop robbing and killing people. Why don't people just stop robbing and killing? It's not so much to ask. It's kind of the, it's kind of the same thing. Right, right, right. You can't base your expectations on unrealistic assumptions. Well, another problem with it, and we'll wrap up here, is, for example, Chris Wallace, the debate moderator yeah. for the, the one presidential debate that we got. <laughs> Afterward, you know, when later on the president wound up getting the virus, right. we heard from Chris Wallace, wear the damn mask. And that's, by the way, that's become, that's the thing that everybody says. Yeah. Wear the damn mask. So everybody thinks they're cool yeah. by putting the word damn in there. Yeah. Right? I'm really serious here about public health because I'm saying the damn mask. Right. That's and where they get so it's, condescending. Exactly. It's, and it's, it, again, uh, to me, the danger of that is mainly, not, well, number one, that you have preening moralists who couldn't care less about all the, the wreckage that's being caused by the crazy lockdown policies, but they care about you wearing the mask. They don't care about any of the other people dying, any of the other crazy things they're doing, ruining your life or whatever. Right. But it, it allows them to be morally superior. Wear the damn mask. But also, of course, it gives us the impression that this virus is something that it's in our power to fix if we just do some simple thing every day. And that if it is overcome, then we will, of course, credit the government and the mask mandate for having overcome it. That's the problem. Yeah, and that's the danger because eventually this is going to end as all viral pandemics eventually end, all infections, they eventually come to an end and they'll all 
do a victory dance. See, people st finally started wearing the mask, therefore it worked. So it's, and, that, and that's, that's where it's kind of a, a, a religious sort of mentality where there's, there's a belief structure and the belief structure says, if you do these things, then these good results will happen. If you follow the Bible, then you will go to heaven and God will love you, so on and so forth. So the, the parallel to that with the mask is, well, if you wear the mask, then this pandemic will go away. And if it's not going away, that means you're not wearing the mask. And then when it goes away, see, you wore the mask. So right. it makes yeah, exactly. and, and of course, it means that if you're wearing it and it's still not going away, it must be your because your neighbor's not wearing right. it. It's your neighbor's fault right. that we're suffering through this. When the fact is that it's not really anybody's fault. You know, that's what we have got to come to terms with, that no matter what we do, short of certain pharmaceutical interventions we might make, and there are treatments that seem to be helping, mm -hmm. but all this other stuff doesn't seem to do anything, but they they need it to so that they can take the credit for it later. If this is the state in all its bizarre, I don't know, narcissism in that it wants to take the credit for things that are going to happen anyway. It, it, it specializes in that, yeah. taking credit for things that are happening anyway. And that is true of, I've often given the example of workplace safety that Ocean, was already yeah. improving, <laughs> um, black employment in professional occupations was already improving before the civil rights. I mean, but then they they want to take credit for all that. But meanwhile, when things happen like, oh, I don't know, 9-11, they, they just, they scratch their heads and say, well, that we couldn't have had anything to do with that because we've just been innocently standing here. Or when 2008 comes along and there's a housing collapse, oh, that doesn't have anything to do with the Federal Reserve. We were just innocently standing here right. and that just occurred. <laughs> so it's always the opposite. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to direct people to tomwoods.com slash 1756 because if I try to get people over, the link is too long. So I've got it up at tomwoods.com slash 1756. People can take a look at what you've done and your footnotes too because you've looked at an awful lot of material for this and decide what they think. But in the meantime, thank you, especially we're recording this, uh, let's just say later than my usual recording slot. And Greg, I appreciate your willingness to meet me on evening turf here and, and thanks so much. Thank you, Tom. I enjoyed it. All right, everybody, before we get going for the weekend, a homework assignment for you for this weekend. If you haven't listened to episode 1754 yet, go do that. Or you can watch the video version, tomwoods.com slash COVID video, because this is the best presentation I've done on this subject. It's the kind of thing that I would like the whole world to hear. So if you could share that on social media, tomwoods.com slash COVID video will take you directly to the video itself. I would be extremely grateful. It's the kind of stuff that very rarely do you see all put together in one place. And it's just relentless and merciless in favor of living real human life and just reclaiming it. So do please do that, tomwoods.com slash COVID video, and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.